here today. I thank you so much for being here with us. Please bless me as I speak now. In your name we pray. Amen. So family, 2018 was one of the hardest years of my life. I want to ask you a question. Has anyone ever had a hard year? If you've had a hard year, just raise your hands. Let me see that. Like for some of us, a hard year, maybe 2020 was a hard year for you. Maybe 2021 was a hard year for you. And sometimes there might be a hard year that you even want to forget. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I know I went through that period of my life, but I kind of want to forget that. 2018, especially the winter of 2018 was one of the hardest years for me. One of the reasons why is I had a second business that I had started and this was not like I had another business and I was working on this one. I had started a business with my business partner. The business failed. I ended up in £30,000 worth of debt. I ended up also having to move out of the house that I was in. And me and my wife, we had to move into one room in my mother-in-law's house while I had two children. And she said to me, hey, Leif, I got a third on the way. So do you think that's a good situation or a challenging situation? So that was a hard time for me. And I remember that year I went to a friend of mine's wedding. And when we went to the wedding, this was us going to the wedding. And on one arm, you could look at us at the wedding and say, oh, they look so nice. But on the flip side, when I was going back home, I was on the bus pushing this pram with my wife, my two kids, and then going back to my wife's mum's house into one room with all of the things that we had and our two children literally in this one room in an older house. And this is kind of a shot of us in the house here. You can kind of see my little son here, Leo at the time, he would have been about one and a half, two years old. And the, there were moments of what I call joy. But what I began to realize, as I'm gonna show you today, is that joy is not just a moment, a feeling, but joy is something that's a choice internally that goes beyond your current circumstances. Are you with me, somebody? So I want to break it down a bit more. In 2023, some years uh, uh, further, I was made redundant again. This was only last year. And when I was made redundant, the difference was, is that I remember uh, my wife said to me, listen, you've been made redundant. But in that period, when I was told I was made redundant, I got the phone call with the team on the, we on the Monday. By the Thursday, I was locked out of all of the systems. And I had a combination of meetings that week. But I remember saying to myself, I've been through this before, but as I go through this, I'm going to say, Lord, let you do what you do. I ended up being made not only redundant, but I got a payout, even though I had been in this company just a year. Now, when we began to look at this company's uh, policy, you only get a payout from redundancy if you've been somewhere for how long? Does anyone know? Two years. Now, the reason why they said they're giving me a payout is because they said when they were given redundancy to other people in the company, those people chose to take the company to court. Leif, you were the only one that not only chose not to take us to court, but you chose to be so good in the whole process. So not only are we gonna give you a payout, and I'm not gonna name the company just because you know it's online, but you know, it's on my LinkedIn, so you could pick which one. As a result, they not only gave me a payout, but they gave me a little extra on top. Are you hearing me, somebody? So the point I'm trying to make to you today is that joy goes beyond your current circumstances. Are you listening to me? That sometimes you could be going through something that could be similar to what you've been through before, but the main difference in the circumstance has to be how you are going to choose to deal with the circumstance. Are you hearing me? Joy between these two periods was the one thing I can attest to that allowed me to see the next challenge in a different way. Follow me in your Bible to so John 16 and verse 22. I just want to share this scripture with you as we start. In John 16, we have Jesus speaking. And when Jesus is speaking in John 16, verse 22, Jesus says, therefore, you now have sorrow. You now have sorrow, but I will see you. Can anyone see it? See you what? Again, the Bible says, and your heart will rejoice and your joy. No one, no one, will take from do you see it in the scripture it's not read on screen but it's read in my bible so these are words of jesus this is jesus speaking your joy no one will take your joy from you you hear me so when jesus says it it's a promise and i began to realize if i began to just to start to apply the words of jesus in my life 
things will be different. Another thing I've begun to learn or began to learn about joy, joy is not only greater than envy, joy allows you to move not just not to not envy someone, but to be but to have more than that. So bitterness, hatred, lusting, prejudice, rivalry, backbiting, all of that gets defeated just by this one thing called joy. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12, Paul breaks it down that to compare ourselves amongst ourselves is not wise. So if I'm living a life and you see me in some challenges, some trials and some circumstances, and I see you living a life, but I see the flashy car and I see the nice house and I see you have a family, I have no idea what got you there. And I might see the external things and think, wow, I want those external things. Envy may rise up in my heart. But the thing that I am forgetting in that moment is what are the things that led to you now or me now seeing these external things? Are you hearing me, somebody? Do I even want to go through the things that you went through to now allow you to show or see the fruit of God's blessing on your life? So I began to realize joy stops me from being envious of other people. It actually allows me to praise God for the blessings in your life because the Bible helps me understand that you are no better than me and I am no better than you. That if, if through sheer discipline and hard work with my own gifts and talents and abilities, God will be able to do things through me that even I'll be surprised of for myself, you hear me? So I have no reason to envy someone, someone else. I have no reason to envy the things of someone else. And I'll tell you why. The most amazing speaker that I love, Pastor Henry Wright, he says it very simply, it's all going to burn. <laughs> in other words, you know, whether you're rich or poor, we all end up in the same place. So what we have on this world, we can't take with us anyway. So why am I going to hate on you or be envious of you on something that we both, when we end up in the same place, can't even take with us? So this is why we talk about joy today. One thing I'm learning and I learned in, as I prepared this sermon about joy, joy fundamentally is a state of being that it literally is an, not just an emotion, it's a result of a choice. You see, many people ask this question, if God is real, why does he allow bad things in this world? But you see, one of the key things, and I'm not going to touch on that, that's not our sermon today, but one thing that's so powerful about God is that he gives every single person on this planet choice. Choice is the one thing that refrains the power of God to intervene in some of the decisions that we make. That God sometimes allows the fruits of our actions, the fruits of our choices to play out completely so that even in our own lives, even if the result God doesn't desire, he allows the results of our choices to play out so that we may see what some of our decisions will lead to in our lives. Are you hearing me, somebody? This is why happiness is the thing that the world seeks but joy is something that we must have. This is, this, this is the difference I want you to understand. Happiness is a fleeting emotion. Happiness is something that is uh, brought upon by external circumstances. Happiness is something that when something happens to you, now I can be happy. In other words, something happened, now I'm happy. Am I making sense? Joy is something happened, irrespective of whether that thing is good or bad, I will choose to be joyful. That's the difference I want you to understand. Let's go deeper into it today. One of my favorite songs by an artist called Black Street, they've got this beautiful song called Joy. It's from their 1995 album. And in the song, it says, goodbye loneliness and so long to my heartache. Now that joy has taken over and decided to what family? To stay. In that song, they dedicate that song, all four of these artists, they dedicate the song to their daughter. And I remember when I first had my daughter, and I was in the hospital, there she is right there, uh, I remember this overwhelming sense of joy flooded my body in a way that I cannot explain. There is something about, you know what I'm talking about, that, that not just that first child moment or that first, you know that first moment you was in love when you was a teenager? Does anyone remember it? Yeah, that, that flood of emotions, but it was something different when I had my daughter, that joy that decided to stay. And when I go forward, I want to break this down even further. So follow me in your Bibles to Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. Are you still with me? All right, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord, what? Always, again, I said, what? 
rejoice. It says, let your moderation be known unto who? All men. And then it says what? The Lord is at hand. Look at verse six. What does verse six say? Be careful. Do not be anxious. So this is a, I think, New King James. But if you've got a King James, it says, don't be anxious. Is that what your one says? Be anxious for nothing. And it says what? But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgivings, let your requests be made known to God. And the what church? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through whom? Christ Jesus. See, the beautiful thing I love about this scripture, we start from verse four, is that it uses this term rejoice. The prefix of rejoice is re, rejoice. To rejoice, when we understand it in the original language, it means to do something again. But Paul does something interesting. By Paul saying rejoice, he's already saying it, doing it, do, by him already saying rejoice, he's already by the text saying do it again. But he says rejoice, again I say rejoice. Uh, in hip hop we call it a double entendre, you're doing it over again. It's a kind of thing where he's helping you understand that yeah, you can rejoice, but rejoice again. And he's helping you understand there's reasons why you should rejoice. And when you rejoice in verse five, he says something powerful that we should let our moderation. And I began to think, okay, what is this term moderation? If you've got the new King James, it will say gentleness. And I thought to myself, okay, gentleness, does that mean I need to be soft? Like just go around, oh, okay, I'm sorry, uh, hi. Yeah. So I okay, hey, so in the Greek, it makes down that gentleness means to for, means forbearance. Forbearance simply means conduct or behavior that you refrain from doing. What Paul is saying, when you make your moderation, your behavior be known unto men, you are choosing to refrain from something that you can do. In other words, Paul is saying, I could knock you out, but I'm choosing to refrain and I'm going to remain joyful because the Lord constrains me. The Bible says in another verse, Paul puts it this way. The love of Christ constrains me. You see why I love Jesus? Jesus could punch you in the face. But Jesus says, you know what? I love you. I remember watching one of my favorite podcasters to listen to is Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is a very interesting individual. Mike Tyson, although we may not believe the same things, one of the things he does say, which is quite interesting when I listened to his podcast recently, he said, I was in front of this guy. And this guy, for some reason, when I was on the airplane, now he did, there's two situations. One time he's on the airplane and he did lose his temper. But on this time, he chose not to lose his temper. And Mike Tyson was there and this guy was in Mike Tyson's face, throwing shots at his face, touching his head. Now, if anyone knows boxing, who is Mike Tyson? One of the best heavyweight boxers of all time. But Mike Tyson got up in this guy's face and says, you know what? I love you. Mike Tyson choose, chose, sorry, to get up off of his seat move location and sit somewhere else so this guy couldn't actually touch him again. If you understand what Mike Tyson did in that moment, Mike Tyson legally is regarded as a weapon. I know my police officer's in the room, I lie. For his training and where he has got to, he would be regarded as a weapon. But for him to choose that, this is what I'm saying. That moderation being made known unto men is to my wife, to my women in the room, one of the most powerful things that women have is the ability to speak. But sometimes, can I be honest in this room? Sometimes in your ability to speak, you can sometimes say things to a man that can cut so deep that a man would prefer to get punched in the face versus hear the words that will come from an angry woman. Are you hearing me? Even Solomon says, it's better to be. I know. You. <laughs> Solomon says, listen, it's not even good to be in, a, it's better to be in a house with a dripping roof than to be in a house with a contentious woman. Are you hearing me today? So Solomon makes it plain that sometimes, even though you may have the ability to say something, that moderation, that ability to control oneself starts fundamentally from this ability to first rejoice, that having joy. Like, why am I going to trouble you today when the Lord himself woke me up this morning? Are you hearing me today? All right, let's go in. You still with me? So there's three things I want to break down for you this today. Joy in the mind, joy in trials, and joy in the spirit. Let's first start with joy in the mind. And to my children, I want you to do me a favor. I've got this little diagram. I just want you to draw it on a piece of paper, if you can. And I want you to draw this diagram out. Now, there's three things we're going to touch on. First thing is joy in the mind. In 2018, 
one of the hardest years. Because I didn't have a car in 2018, I would have to take public transport from one location to another. And one time I was separate from my wife and my wife went ahead to a friend of ours house named Jermaine and Danielle. My, friend, my wife went ahead with our, my, my daughter to that house. And because I had to travel there with my son, my wife always told me when my son was this age, make sure you, you have a cable that connects to the, your son. Make sure you walk with the cable because our son likes to run off. Now in my head, I'm like, this is like a dog leash. I don't like this cable. And every time I'm walking with my son with this cable, I'm thinking it was a rucksack. All right, I'll give you that. All right, it's a rucksack. But I think of it like a leash. You see the, the male female, you feel me? So I'm walking with my son with this leash. And I said, <laughs> sorry, babe, rucksack. All right. So I'm walking with my son with the rucksack. And I said, you know what, Cha? Let me take off the rucksack. So I take off the rucksack now and I'm walking with my son. And you know, in me trying to get to the house much faster, basically you've got Hackbridge train station and you have to walk down a road called Nightingale Road to get to Jermaine's house. It's really a good, at least hundred meters, maybe 150 meter walk. And I'm tricking ahead and I just don't know what happened. I lost control. Leo was now five, 10 meters behind me because I chose not to use the rucksack, yeah? I'm in trouble now. As I look back, don't I see Leo, maybe where you are, Mel, about there, yeah? And I say to Leo, Leo, come here now. Leo looked at me, yeah? Then he went, <laughs> ran into the road. I don't know. It, the bus was coming, right? As the bus was coming, I ran into the road. I didn't care if there was a car. I didn't care if there was nothing. I was like, just stop. Like, my hands will stop the cars, yeah? My son was in the middle of the road. One car had to... And then I remember picking up my son, going over to the side of the road. I was almost in tears. And I began to just say, listen, you've got to listen to me. In that moment, I was so happy because my son was safe. You hear me? You see, one thing I've learned about joy is that joy... And look at this word, this um, statement. One of my favorite authors is Dr. Caroline Leaf. She writes this book, Switch on Your Brain. I advise anybody to read this book. It's powerful. She says, you cannot sit back and wait to be happy and healthy. You have a great, to have a great thought and have a great thought life. You have to make a choice to make this happen. You see, in the moment when I picked up my son, I could have chose in that moment to scold my son for not listening, to tell him off for not listening, to say to him, why didn't you listen to me? But in the moment, all I could think about was what? He's safe, you hear me? And I'm in trouble, yes. <laughs> in the moment, all I could think about was praise God, hallelujah, my son is safe. You see, the thing I want you to understand about joy is that when you are in a circumstance, joy is fundamentally an outflowing of what you focus on. So if I'm going through a situation, a trial in life, in my mind, if I focus on the negative, then that's where my focus will be. Are you hearing me? But if I focus on the positive and I choose to stay there, to stay there, right? Just like my favorite artist, Blackstreet, when they said this in their, in their, in their song, where they said, look, joy has and, and decided to stay. If I decide to stay there, the outflowing will be different. In a study done by Morton L. Kingbatch, he says, in the brain, joy triggers activity in several pleasure-related hotspots. They're distributed throughout the brain. The sensation of joy is then spread to other parts of the central nervous system through chemical transmitters or chemical uh, messengers called neurotransmitters. They say chemicals such as dopamine and oxytocin. These chemicals get released as you decide to stay joyful. You hear me, somebody? This is why when you're around people that are joyful, even when they don't say nothing, for some reason, you start to feel different. Do you understand what I mean? That's why when we stay joyful, it has a massive impact on us as well. Look at this. It says, this is another study that I found joy a distinctive positive emotion it says interestingly joy is both a what family trait and a state this means that while some of us only experience it as a result of a joyful situation kind of like happiness others have a capacity for it 
meaning they can experience joy regardless of whether they've encountered something joyful. So the science is proving what God has said in his word. Do you hear me? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. When Paul says always, he's not saying when you get paid. You know what I'm saying? When you get that new car, he's saying always. He goes a bit deeper. Let me show you this. Paul goes a bit deeper in the same scripture in chapter four. He says, but verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you securely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. In verse 12, he says, I know how to be abased, meaning I don't have much. I'm in a state of lack. He says, I've learned how to be abased and I know how to abound, meaning I am in a state of blessing and I'm abounding in abundance. He goes on to say, everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. See, Paul is helping us understand that you know, and then I'll show you, I'll show you the next verse afterwards, right? But the key thing I want you to understand, Paul is breaking it down, that I've learned to abound and I've learned how to be abased. I've learned to be hungry and I've learned to be full. So he's helping us really break this down, that even before we get to that stage, verse four comes beforehand to help us understand. First, you have to rejoice, because if you don't rejoice, how are you going to learn when you have or when you have not how to be in a state of contentment? Are you with me? Let's go on a bit further. 2020, I learned when you don't trust God, you can also make some selfish decisions. This was a big situation for me. I also learned one of the key things I lacked very early on in my marriage. And actually, listen up, is to have male mentorship. I seriously learned very quickly that I needed it and one of the key things I'm learning specifically it says it in the book of Titus I believe where it says the old men should teach the younger and the old women should teach the younger women and I feel like there's some men here the bible says the hoary head is a crown of glory there's some men here on a side note who have some wisdom in this room I think it's incumbent upon you to take a younger man to mentor him a younger woman to the women here to mentor them there's power in that but I digress in 2020, we had basically, we were in that one room in my mother's house. When we were in that one room, my mother-in-law had to write a letter to Bromley Council to say that we couldn't fit and that we needed extra space. I remember my wife came to me specifically one day in 2020, no, 2019. And she said to me, Leif, I need to go and get some food for our children. I just want to, let me just buy a can of beans. I went to my wallet. I didn't have even 10p. I went to my bank account. I didn't even have 10 pounds. It was like minus something. Yeah. Did I have credit cards? No. So I, my choices had led us into a place where I couldn't even buy a can of beans for my family. You hear me today? So I realized now I've got to make a difference. This was 2020. So my brother stepped up and to be my mentor, my big brother, he lives in America and he began to mentor me in this period. And very quickly, we were able to move from this house because the letter was written. Huh? Sorry? Not one other letter. Oh yeah, there was a house in between this one. So we moved from this one into a two bed house. Then we went from the two bed house into a three bed house. And then as my brother's been mentoring me, he helped me learn how to get my income up, how to focus on what I'm good at and how to work a lot harder to save and stuff. And I remember in 2023, no, two, 2022, that was the year that my wife started to save the Gusto boxes. Am I correct? Yes. Good. July of 2022, I've got to get it right. And she felt an overwhelming conviction that we're going to move house. This time, guess how much money I had in my account? 10 pounds. Like it was low. It wasn't, it wasn't UK house money, yeah? And we had an ISA. My brother told me to get a lifetime ISA. And how much did we have? About 2,400 pounds, about that, in the ISA. But the thing with the ISA, you can't activate the money unless you're going to buy a home. 
So I began to say the July of 20, 2022, my wife started to feel a conviction that we're going to move house. She started to save the Gusto boxes. Do you know what Gusto is? When you get food to your house, it's a bit like HelloFresh. Yeah. And you get these food boxes to your house. And my wife started to save the boxes, although the money was low. That same year, I got a contract. It was like over £10,000 out of nowhere from a friend of mine. That friend, he got loads of money in and he said, Leif, I'm going to give you a job, 10 grand job. And I don't know how that happened. Like, <laughs> then I spoke to her, my sister. My sister sold a house and she said, Leif, I'm going to give you some money for, the, for your house. Boom. Then she spoke to a family member and that gave us the down payment for our house that we live in right now that you can see on the end here. So within the space of two years, because I had male mentorship, we were able to not only move into our home, but that's the home we're in today. And from that point, it's helped me to increase my income because of the mentorship of my brother. You hear me? Why do I say that? One of the key things my brother is, my brother's actually a pastor in a church. And one thing my brother said, Leif, you've got to learn to be content. Not am be ambitious, be ambitious, but be content in everything that you have. So contentment and ambition are two different things. Some people in the Christian church like to believe because you're content, oh no, we shouldn't be rich. That's another sermon. The point I'm making is ambition is the application, the good stewardship of the gifts that God has given you. Sometimes those gifts can lead to financial gain. Sometimes those gifts can lead to you being able to provide for your home. Are you with me? But most importantly, those gifts are for the edification of God's church. That's fundamentally first what those gifts are for. That's another sermon. So when you think of joy, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Anyone in this room, when you think of joy, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Anyone? Peace. I love that one. Anyone? Happiness. Yes. Anyone? When you think of joy, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Anyone? Last one. Laughter. Who did you say? Sound mind. All of that is true. These are the blessings of joy. One of the key things I've learned is this Japanese principle called Ikigai. I don't know if anyone may have, may have, may not have heard of this, but basically it says that, you know, you take what you love, you take what the world needs, you take what you can be paid for, and you take what you're good at. And Ikigai, what it basically does is it represents uh, the word Iki meaning live and the word Gai meaning reason or reason to live. It's a Japanese principle to help you understand not only what you're good at, but how you can start to fundamentally shift where you are at currently to be in a place of abundance because you start to be a good steward of what God has given you. You hear me? That's another sermon, but we'll go into that another day. Invite me back and I'll get into that one. All right. So joy in your trials. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say what church? So when we talk about rejoice now, I want to go into the second point, which is on circumstances. Are you still with me? All right. So when we talk about circumstances, this is a very interesting word. It comes from the Latin. In the Latin is two words. Circum meaning to like around or round like circle. Circum and stance meaning the place where you stand or standing. So when we say circumstance, we're saying we're in a situation, but we're not moving. And the things around us are our circumstances. So when you're in a circumstance, you are not trying to get out of it. It's affecting you because these are things that's happening around you. Are you listening to me today? This is what we call circumstances. When I began to look at it through another psychologist, they broke down circumstances as trials, trials or the situations or the issues that happen in life. James puts it so beautifully that James says to count it all what church joy when you go through what diverse trials. Think of it another way. When you go through different circumstances, Count it all joy. The difference with joy in this situation, circumstance to someone who doesn't have joy, is when they are stuck still and the circumstances around them continuously affect them and they do not move. But uh, when you are a joyful person, a circumstance happens to you, but you don't let that keep you still. Are you hear me today? I want you to understand this. It's very different to happiness. Happiness is when the emotions are affecting you and because of those things that's happening around you, now I'm choosing to be happy. When trials happen, trials still keep the joyful person moving. When you are not joyful and trials, circumstances happen, they debilitate you. They make you not move. They make you feel like I'm stuck. I cannot do anything. When you are a joyful person, you understand 
whose you are. Therefore, because God is in control, even though the trial is on me, even though the situation, the circumstance is upon me, because God is in control, I know that he can actually take care of this. I don't have to be stuck. I know I can move because God is in my life. You see, the Bible says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The Bible also breaks it down that God loved us first. Therefore, we don't have to be stuck when we go through trials. One of the key things that keeps us stuck, and I began to find this study uh, in the pandemic. It says that the news exposure during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they began to do a study on it. And they said the evidence indicates that elevated exposure to news coverage of mass trauma events, natural disasters, terrorist attacks, predicts symptoms of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, even for individuals not directly exposed to the traumatic event. So the, so the studies are showing that it's actually not in our benefit to consume too much news. Now do with that as you please. I'm not telling you what to do. But as for me and my house, <laughs> are you with me? I don't want to be in a state of trauma and depression. So I began to think, okay, cool. My mom, I spoke to my mom about this. My mom said, Leif, I watch the news to be informed. Have you ever heard someone say that to you? But in being informed, because you and I, we naturally, God has given us a natural ability to want to solve these problems. Are you hearing me? It's a natural thing that God has put inside of us. But when these things are so big and so beyond us, and we also internally have our own individual situations that we are individually dealing with in our own homes, the weight of the world's trauma and situations plus our own, this is why it can lead to these feelings in the individual's life. Am I making sense? The study goes on to say that these effects persist across multiple mediums, not just TV. Watch this including news consumed via what print, radio, television, and social media. It goes on to say secondary sources, for example, social media, watch this, are increasingly relied upon for news updates and young adults reported higher daily engagement with news via social media than any other source early in the pandemic. Now, if you extrapolate that out and you began to see that social media can lead to addiction. And there's been increased rates of things like ADHD and other things. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just going off what I'm studying. Tell me if I'm wrong, anyone. But what it's starting to do is starting to have higher cases of anxiety in the populace and even the people. Are you hearing me? When I speak to school teachers, they're telling me about their students who are in a higher state of anxiety. Now, the thing is this, we are all human beings, but from the studies, they are finding out that especially our young girls are being impacted by this heavily, heavily. That's why you think, see things like transgender on the rise, especially amongst our girls. You see things like trauma on the rise, especially amongst our young girls. You see, especially with our young boys, things like violent crime is on the rise, especially in towns and cities where it is people are of a similar economic status are congregated in and amongst themselves nonstop. They're seeing the news, they're seeing what's on their phones and it's increasing in number. This is making many people anxious. Then you look at the food and how the, f that's, hey, that's another sermon. Are you hearing me today? What's the point I'm making? Lower your news consumption, please. Like just for the sake of your home. It goes on the University of Cambridge. Are they a, res a respected body? They go on to say that words like stupid or loser, worthless, in the English language have negative connotations. Repeating these words enough can lead to severe depression, insomnia, and even suicide. In addition to emotional impacts of such words, they can also be physically damaging to the body. So the words themselves are not only impacting the mind, they have a physical impact on the body. Has anyone ever seen the rice experiment before? When they have three jars of rice, they have one jar where they take a, a rice and they close the jar and they only speak negative words to that rice. Rice, I'm, I'm being so serious. Google rice experiment words. Then they take another jar and they speak only positive words to the jar of rice. Joy, happiness, you're great, you're good. 
The jar of rice with the good words starts to con convert into wine. The jar of rice that was spoken negative words to started to mold and decay. Rice. I'm telling, I'm, listen, Google me. <laughs> rice experiment. Yeah. And then the University of Cambridge broke it up by saying a study from Cambridge broke down showed that people who were able to use positive words to describe their feelings were able to feel more positive emotions than those who weren't. Eliana, what's something that daddy always says to you? Think carefully. I'll put you on the spot. I say my daughter is beautiful. I say my daughter is smart, right? This is the things that I want you to understand. Listen, I'm programming her mind. I'm telling you straight, I am programming you. I want my daughters to understand, and my sons, I don't know where they are. One is there. But I want them to understand that they can be great and mighty in the Lord. Are you hearing me today? Like what you say to them has a massive impact. Do you know why many of us as adults, we have dreams and aspirations, but we don't do it? Because when we deep where it's coming from, many of us have parents, whether consciously or, or, or whether intentionally or unintentionally, spoke negative words over us and now we have dreams and aspirations and we prefer to stay in a job that we hate versus at least to try and go after the dreams that's on our hearts. Are you hearing me today? It goes deeper. Same study, but this doctor, now you can Google me. I'm giving you a reference. His name is Dr. John or Jochen. Please tell me I'm saying it right. Jochen, Jochen, Menges from Cambridge. He says how we feel often depends largely on how people around us feel. This is why we have to be very intentional in who we surround ourselves with. That's why we have to be very intentional over the things that we watch. That's why in Philippines it says, whatever things are of virtue, whatever things are of good report, that we should think upon these things, right? That when we're around people that are negative, even if we're not trying to be negative, the impact of those people start to have it, starts to have an impact upon us. You see, an uh, amazing speaker that I love, his name is Jim Ron. He breaks it down that we are the sum of the five people we spend the closest amount of time with. Now, I, must, I like to look at studies. I don't know how true that is, but after seeing this and knowing what Jim Ron said, I chose very early on to be very careful and intentional about who I spend the amount of time with. When I was about 15 years old, my mom, so 14 years old, my mom took me to Jamaica. And when she took me to Jamaica, it was a very hard time for me because that same year, I told you last time, I was diagnosed with a condition called idiopathic rheumatoid juvenile arthritis. And I was struggling with my health in that period. And on the summers, my mum would bring me back. But I had a cousin at the time. I won't say his name. But that cousin at the time, my mum would bring me around. But this cousin, because where we lived in South London, he was around people that were, mm, let's just say they weren't the best people to be around. And they were selling things on the street that, you know, the children are here that you and I shouldn't partake in. Is that a fair thing to say? You know what I'm saying? Now, as a result, that same cousin, I began to understand because mum was taking me back to Jamaica. I was going to school. When I would come back in the summers, I would try my best to see my cousin, but not spend time with my cousin. Same cousin, the summer I chose to change being around him as much, my hips started to get really bad. And I really wanted to be around my cousin, but I was bedridden for three months. I was telling you next time. The three months I was bedridden, my cousin gets locked up by the police. Now, when I was on the bed, was I like, hallelujah, I'm in so much pain on this bed. Do you hear me today? But now when I look back, I'm like, hallelujah. You see, the thing I want you to understand, look back on the trials in your life. And sometimes in the trial in your life, while I was bedridden, God was protecting me from potentially having a record. Are you hearing me today? While I was bedridden, same cousin, because of his health choices, now has lupus. When I call my cousin, he basically spoke to the doctors. They said, because of your younger years of smoking X, Y, and Z, and not sleeping well and X, X stuff, that has, those health choices have led to what you're dealing with now as a man, as an adult man. Are you hearing me today? All because of his choices as a teenager, as a teenager. It gets so deep because when you break it down now, one of the key things I'm learning is the power of words. In Proverbs, it says death. Actually, how much time do I have? 
Yeah. All right. Death and life is in the power of the. So what you speak not only has a physical impact on the body, it has a mental impact as well. So this is why it's very important to use power words, power words. One of the key scriptures that I'm beginning to understand even more is that when we think about the presence of the Lord in our life, the Bible says here, thou will show me the path of, what does it say? Path of what? Life, yeah? Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So if I focus on being in God's presence, if I focus on the presence of the Lord, that is where what is found? Life is found. The fullness of joy is found. Am I making sense? But when I am focused on the circumstance, it makes me stand still. Therefore, I'm not focused on the presence that can help me to have fullness of joy. Are we making sense? This is why it's important to have joy in the spirit. To my last point, I'm breaking down joy in the spirit. When we understand joy, that joy is a fruit of what we focus on. That fundamentally, because the Bible lets us know that this is Galatians 5 breaks it down, that these are the fruit of the spirit. In another scripture, it breaks down that the spirit is a gift. And you know that? That it's a gift of the spirit. That therefore, when God chooses to give you love and joy and peace and patience, etc., that all of that is a gift. And if it's a gift, how should one receive a gift? With? <laughs> it's so cyclical, isn't it? Right? Uh a gift is what we call unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to get it. You may even not have deserved it, but someone still gave it to you anyway. That when it comes on to what we focus on, that joy being a fruit of the spirit is actually second in line. Some like to put it as uh, tongues, but that's another sermon. But it's actually joy. That love first, the fruit of that is joy. I began to look at it. And this study takes it even a step further, that when we understand joy, one of the benefits of joy is that you actually become a more grateful person. Who's better to be around, grateful people or miserable people? Are you with me? Gratitude is associated with a personal benefit that is not intentionally sought after, deserved or earned, but rather because of the good intentions of another person. This is a neuroscientist from positivepsychology.com, and it was scientifically reviewed by William Smith, PhD. In other words, I like to look at studies that have been peer reviewed. You understand the benefits of that, right? So when I basically was looking at this, that when we are grateful people, this is a very strong defense to make sure that we consistently have joy in our lives. So if you sit here today and you were to think, what's maybe three things that I can be grateful for? You just sit there and you think, okay, I'm going to open my phone and I might have a notes app and I'm going to say, what's three things I'm grateful for? Maybe it's that I've got life. Maybe it's that I can financially provide for myself. Maybe it's that I have health. Maybe it's that I have family, a marriage, a relationship, etc. Are you with me, everyone? Notice most of the time, the things that we are most grateful for, I'm saying most grateful for, are not things that have to connect with money. Have you noticed that the things that we're most grateful for doesn't mean that we're not grateful for the job or the business or whatever it may be. But generally, it tends to be when you think about it, if you was on your last dying bed or your last wishes, what's the number one thing that you'd want your boss to come and tell you to send that email? Or would it be to have your closest loved ones to be around you in those moments? Are you with me? You see, when we understand gratitude, that the fruit of that is actually joy, right? Or it comes along with joy. One of the places that we see this a lot in the Bible is especially in the story of Paul and Silas. In Acts 16, it breaks down that Paul and Silas, they were preaching the gospel. And while they were preaching the gospel, there was a woman possessed with a demon, demonic spirit that was saying, hey, you men of God, preaching the gospel. And it got to a point where Paul and Silas had to rebuke this woman. And in them rebuking this woman, the people of the town was like, yo, I don't like these guys because they're stopping us from making money. In other words, this woman that was basically saying to them, you men of 
that are, are mm. preaching the gospel. The locals at the time were merchants who were making money off this woman going around speaking to Paul and doing it to others. As a result, they end up going to prison. And while they go to prison, the Bible says that they began to sing hymns and started to praise. Paul and Silas were grateful to be locked up because they were doing God's work. And as they were locked up and as they began to sing in praise, the Bible says, do anyone know the story? That the place began to shake and that the prisoners began to get loose and their chains began to be let free. And the actual guards at the time drew a knife to kill themselves because they thought that the guards would have killed, sorry, the prisoners would have killed them. And if the prisoners didn't kill them, their authorities would have killed them anyway. You hear me? Paul and Silas said, hey, don't draw your sword. Don't worry. You will not be harmed. And it was in that moment that Paul and Silas began to express gratitude, stay in prison, but still be joyful. Although their current circumstance, they physically couldn't move, but mentally they were in full motion. Are you hearing me? Because they had joy. Before we go today, there's three points I want to highlight around this gratitude and based in joy benefits that it makes you a happier person. It makes you a fitter person and it makes you a better person. If you want these slides, ask Ashley, he'll give it to you. All right. Good. Now, when we talk about this, I've already shown you the science which breaks down how it physically can impact the mind. Joy also goes a step further. It emboldens your immune system, makes you have less pain and aches optimum blood pressure and cardiac function. And for those who understand the benefits of sleep, I know there's a doctor in the room, I don't know his name, maybe I do. Uh, better sleep cycles because you have joy. You can sleep better, right? Uh, to the man them in the room, when you add testosterone, oh my gosh, your, your sleep it becomes phenomenal. But that's another sermon, don't worry about that. So the key thing I want you to understand is this. I want you to do what we call a gratitude list, a gratitude list. And this is how it's going to work. I like to be very practical now with my sermons, yeah? I want you to make a list. On one side, I'm grateful to. Who are you grateful to? It might be a wife. It might be a child. It might be a friend, et cetera, yeah? And on the other side, what are you grateful for? Does that make sense? Yeah, you can take a picture if you want. Or ask Ashley and they'll send you an email, right? So who are you grateful to and what are you grateful for? Now, before we close, I want someone to tell me who are they grateful to? Who are they grateful to? Anyone? You're grateful to? Oh. Hey, I'm preaching you. Hey, listen. All right, Leo. Mommy. All right. Who are you grateful to? Anyone? You're grateful to? Who said that? Hey, that's good branding points, my brother. I love that. Yeah? You're grateful to your wife. Anyone else? Last one. Who are you grateful to? You're grateful to your son. I love that. Now, I want you to tell me. Uh, who else did have one? Do you have one? Did you have one? Go on, Sasha. Is you grateful for her? That's fine. Yeah, come on. And then now I want you to say, what are you grateful for? You're grateful for a house. Amen. You're grateful for life. Amen. You're grateful for a bed to sleep in. Amen. You're grateful for anyone. Sorry? Your joy. Who said salvation? Thank you, my sister. Salvation. Anyone? You're grateful for... Last one, my job, yeah? Hey, Leo, did you have another one? Food, amen. Now notice, when we say what we're grateful for, what happens to our whole posture? What happens to our face? What happens to how we speak? What happens when you communicate your gratefulness to someone else? Are you hearing me, family? Imagine a church community where we always talk about what we're grateful for. Imagine when we go to work, we live as if we're grateful for the job that sometimes can be challenging. Imagine if you saw your job like this. It's an investment into my future dreams. Does that change how you deal with a difficult situation, a difficult job? Are you hearing me? That's why I want everyone in this room, please make your grateful list because it will be beneficial to you today. So when you think about joy as we close, it really comes for me from these three key things now for you it may be more but the key thing in john 16 verse 22 jesus says your joy will never be taken away from you and i pray today that you let that be your choice in your life amen
Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for this Sabbath day. I praise Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that someone, one in this room, took something powerful from this message to apply in their lives. And in Jesus' name, we pray that we can be more joyful Christians, more joyful people in all that we do. And we remember that this is a gift that comes only from your Holy Spirit. So we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, let the church say, amen. Amen. Thank you.